escape my bride. Let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of a speed beat of steel, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. And yes, the day has finally come. The day for this American to finally talk about a true great of the American automobile industry. In Victorian Europe, cars were hand-built and expensive, but in the USA, cars would be designed and built very differently. Different standards, uh, different consumer requirements, and most definitely new and efficient manufacturing methods. This man is among the most famous of all Henrys in the automotive world, not only in the USA, but across the globe. So let's now talk about the man that built the foundation of the U.S. automotive industry, Henry Leland. This Vermont native was born in Danville in 1843. And unlike most kids, from a young age, he would take his toys apart, but also be able to put them back together. Serious skills at a young age. The family moved to Massachusetts when he was a young teen, and since college was outside of the family means, he took an apprenticeship at a local metalworking company as a machinist. After completing his apprenticeship, he quickly found work at the U.S. Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, under the auspices of Colt. Hostilities were brewing in the USA, and young Henry found himself having to make gun and rifle parts like there was no tomorrow. He worked there throughout the war and the experience had a tremendous impact on him. Consider the situation. The war between the states required guns to fight. Lots of them. Now a good gunsmith can certainly make a good gun by hand in his forge, but can the same gunsmith make a hundred identical guns? It's not as easy as you might think. They may all look the same, but the tolerances involved between the moving parts of a gun are slim. It's most likely that 100 handmade guns would work, but if you took them apart and mixed the parts together, you'd probably have one heck of a time trying to get 100 working guns put back together again. Unless a ridiculous amount of time was spent in their making, the parts would be close to the same, but would be fitted to each gun frame specifically, and thus parts interchangeability is lost. Of course, the U.S. Armory wasn't making just 100 guns. They were pumping out tens of thousands of them, and the principle of parts interchangeability was paramount to the U.S. Army. If every soldier's gun is identical, then field repair is simple. Field parts swapping to make one working gun out of two or more broken ones is doable, and of course ammunition can be redesigned to take advantage of such rigorous standardization. Running the tools and using the Army's methods to maintain this standard was young Mr. Leland's job, and it never left him. After the war, he went to Rhode Island, where he went to work for Brown and Sharp Company. This company manufactured a variety of goods, one of them sewing machines. Hank took over that division of the company and over the next 18 years applied what he learned making guns to make sewing machines. Sewing machines, like guns, have lots of moving parts that must act in sync with each other or the whole thing goes screwy. Building a new or repairing a broken machine without parts interchangeability was a very tedious process of hand-fitting parts. With it, repair and assembly of the machines was quick and easy, and cheaper in the long run. In the last few years of his time at Brown and Sharp, he traveled quite a bit around the country promoting new business, and in 1890 decided to leave the company, move to Detroit, and start his own machining firm. He chose Detroit for a number of reasons. He did good business there and had connections. The raw materials needed to run such a company were in abundant supply and there was plenty of available workforce, both skilled and unskilled. He partnered up and founded the Leland, Falconer and Norton Company. They started making spare parts for other companies' assembly lines, mostly bicycle and marine components. But it was only after a few years that they started making complete gas engines and then selling them to car manufacturers. His engines were made to the same precision he built his career on, and they sold extremely well. Indeed, by 1899, he was even making transmissions for car makers. By 1902, he was ready for his next move. One of his customers, a Detroit Motor Company, was in trouble. 
Their figurehead was a, and lead engineer had left the company and the folks with the money and that backed the company were ready to throw in the towel. Henry was, of course, aware of this as he supplied parts to most of the Detroit automakers and had his finger on the pulse of the Motor City. Indeed, Henry was asked by the company men to inspect the facilities and give evaluation of assets since they were expecting to be selling everything off soon. But Henry had a better plan. Here's what he did. He explained to these money men that selling the company was not the answer. He was the answer. He could take this company that was not making money and, by using his precision manufacturing methods, rebuild the company into the company it was always meant to be the builder of a car without peer anywhere in the world. And so, with the blessing of the board, Henry Leland assumed control of the Detroit Motor Company. And he immediately did two things. He began to reorganize their manufacturing process to meet his exacting standards. And second, to rename the company to reflect that standard. As the name, he chose the French explorer who founded the city of Detroit in 1701, whose name, because of Henry Leland, is known world over as the American standard of quality, Cadillac. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History. We'll see you next week. Peace.